Welcome everyone. We're just uh, waiting for uh, one minute or two and we will start our webinar. Okay, I think it's time to start. Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Libraries Serving Communities Post-COVID-19 Recovery. This is a webinar presented by Reforma, the National Library Association to promote library and information services to Latinos and the Spanish speaking by the Special Libraries Association, SLA, and ACRIL, the Association of Caribbean University Research and Institutional Libraries. My name is Loida Garcia Figo. I am the moderator of this event. I am an international library consultant, a Reforma past president, and the co-chair of the Reforma International Committee. Elizabeth Garcia is the other co-chair and we have a great team. Our speakers today will share experiences best examples, models, and recommendations for libraries post COVID-19 recovery. Libraries are essential to the recovery of communities deeply impacted by COVID-19 and the pandemic. Our guest speakers will share news from academic, public, school, and special libraries in the USA and in the Caribbean, strategizing along with library workers to continue providing programs and services to the communities they serve. Thank you all for joining us live and you can ask questions on the Q&A section of this webinar room. We will take them at the end. I would like to thank the format leadership, uh, President Nicanor Diaz and the board for supporting the format international relations and the webinars also the amazing uh, communications and uh, web team with Edwin Rodarte and Celia Avila and Madeline Peña are also supporting. We will have two international webinars this term until June 2022. And we are delighted to present the webinar today with SLA and Acuil. I would like to encourage everyone to stay tuned for more information about our next webinar, which will be presented in collaboration with Salon, the seminar uh, on acquisition of Latin American library materials, and with the Latin America and Caribbean section of IFLA, also known as IFLA LAC. So it's a very exciting time for Reforma in our international relations. Uh, now it's time to welcome our speakers, and they are Nicanor Diaz, Reforma President and Immigrant Services Manager at Denver Public Library. Roxana Cruz, Instruction and Reference Librarian at Santa Monica College in California, and she is coming from the Special Libraries Association. Elisa Garcia, Reforma Northeast President, Supervising Librarian in Teen Services at New York Public Library and Elizabeth Pierre-Louis, PhD Executive Secretary of ACRIL, the Association of Caribbean University Research and Institutional Libraries. We are very excited. It's the first time that Reforma is collaborating with SLA and ACRIL, and we are very happy about that. Our, speaker, uh, our speakers will um, participate in this in the order I mentioned, and now we will welcome Nicanor Diaz, President of Reforma. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Loida. I'm gonna go and share my screen.
All right. Uh, thanks again, uh, Lloyda, for putting this together and uh, giving us the opportunity to be here uh, this morning or this afternoon, wherever you may be, uh, to talk about this important work. Um, so my name is uh, Nicanor Diaz. I'm the current president for Reforma National, and I'm the immigrant services manager for the Denver Public Library. Uh, I've been involved with Reforma since 2005 when I started working at the High Plains Library District as a substitute clerk. Throughout my years in Reform, I've held many, many positions and I've done a lot of different works. I was the president of the Colorado chapter and I was also the central chapter representative for four years before uh, becoming the Reform National President. Uh, I graduated from the University of Denver in 2011 and began working for the Denver Public Library as a branch manager and one of the Southwest branches that predominantly serves uh, Spanish speakers in 2014. And I've been in, in my current position uh, for about five years. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about some of the work that Reforma has done to support libraries as they attempt to recover um, from the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we've done here at the Denver Public Library. Uh, but before we start, a little bit of history about Reforma. It was founded in 1971 by Dr. Arnulfo Trejo, and, and uh, we have approximately 1,200 members throughout the country and the world since we do, Reforma does have an international membership that is free to anyone. So if you're not living in the United States and you want to become a Reforma member, you can definitely sign up as an international member. And as Lloyda had mentioned, being the, uh, one of the co-chairs of the uh, International Relationship Committee, um, we're always looking ways, we're always looking for ways to partner with our international members and be able to provide webinars like this one so they can uh, work on their career development. Um, we have about 20 some chapters throughout the United States and you can see them in this map here. Um, the work that Reforma National does really relies on the, the work that the chapters do in our membership. So we are eternally grateful for all the work that they do. Um, with the chapters and our members, we help build relationships with libraries to strengthen communities and programs that uh, we offer for Spanish, for our Spanish speaking community. Um, some of the things, some of the work, just to highlight some of the work that our members do, they, they coordinate a newsletter where we share information about what Reforma does. Uh, we help uh, with career development, with webinars that promote career development like this one. Uh, we help establish chapters. So if you're in a state that doesn't have a chapter and you think that it would be great, we have a, a, com a committee the, or dev committee that can help establish that chapter. We also help with fundraisers, we award scholarships, um, and we even help to lobby for legislation that re furthers reform as mission. Obviously, again, this is just a, a small snapshot of everything that Reforma does. And again, it's because of our wonderful members that we are able to do this. And very quickly, I just want to highlight this year's executive committee. Um, most of us are serving through the end of June, uh, June 2022. Uh, and if you're interested in becoming uh, an executive committee member, please let me know. I would be happy to talk more about it with you. And we're always looking for uh, new folks that are passionate about serving um, our communities. So now to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that Reforma has done. We, we know that uh, during COVID, a lot of our libraries had to shut down and we probably lost a lot of contact with some of our, our community members. And now as we start to reopen up, we wanna rebuild those communities and we wanna welcome folks back into the buildings. Also from experience, I know that a lot of libraries have lost a big part of their budgets. Um, DPL was fortunate enough that we didn't have to lay anyone off during our closures, but we were definitely in a hiring freeze and our budget was cut significantly, which impact our, impacted our ability to do any sort of programming. 
Um, so one of the things that Reforma does is we offer grants to libraries and our members and chapters to be able to start beginning to, to develop some of those programs and bringing folks in. Um, the couple that I'm gonna talk about are the DIA, the mini DIA grants um, that are listed here. Here are the winners for this year. Um, Dia del Niño takes place the last Sunday in April, so we're, these programs haven't happened yet, but we're excited to see what our members are going to do with the grants that they received for Reforma and to be able to use this not only to reconnect with their community, but also to highlight the importance of storytelling, particularly those stories that highlight the Latino culture. Um, another grant that Reforma offers that we just wrap this one up and we'll be opening it up again at the end of the year in case you're interested, um, is the Reforma National Grant Program. This is open to Reforma chapters or members that are member at large, um, and they must be current paying members. But I wanted to highlight the four uh, members that we selected uh, to do programs this year through the Reforma National Grant Program. So the first one is the ebook, Beyond Virtual and Hybrid Programs, How Libraries Recreated a Community During COVID-19 by Mary Marquez, who is a member of the Reforma Northeast chapter. And this is a pretty interesting program uh, because they're gonna attempt to collect virtual and hybrid programs that were created during COVID-19 um, and how Reforma Northeast librarians reinvented in-person programs to connect, the to connect to the virtual environment, some of the challenges they faced and how they were able, able to engage with the audience to reconnect, um, reconnect them with information and library resources. So this is gonna be, I hope that this gives you some ideas to, to do some programs at your locations as well. I'm really interested to see, particularly this one, to see how it goes. Um, because I, I just find the topic fascinating as to how different libraries shifted to be able to um, try their best to re-engage with their communities while the branches were closed. Uh, the next one is Small Tastes of the Wonders of El Salvador by Zoila Martel. Uh, she's a member of the Reforma LA chapter. And uh, from some experience doing some food programs at DPL after we reopened uh, post COVID. These are wonderful ways to connect, not only with some local businesses that might need, um, might need some additional publicity or might need like some additional work to reconnect with their communities, but also to bring folks into the library. I know we did one here at the Denver Public Library um, around different foods throughout Latin America and they were very well attended. Another very interesting one is preserving Chicanix, Latinx and indigenous people stories by Joelle Quigley. Uh, they're a member at large. Um, and this program is gonna focus at the Colorado State University and Pueblo Library um, to host a summer institute that's focused on educational programming dedicated to the study and preservation of Chicanix, Latinx and indigenous peoples and environments of the Southwest. And then finally, another really good program to reconnect with the community is the Day of the Dead Community Altar by Yumaris Polanco Miller, who's also a Reforma at large member. Um, and during this program, they'll celebrate Day of the Dead as it's celebrated by the Mexican people. Um, and the program will work in collaboration and support the community, which again is what we're trying to, to highlight post COVID is how we can get uh, re-establish re those connections with our community. Um, another really good program that happened during COVID that I hope we can continue were the summer and winter book buzz series that were uh, highlighted by, well, they were actually put together by the Northeast chapter and the LA chapter. Uh, these book buzz series invited publishers where, um, they were open to librarians, educators, students, and professionals who were interested in serving the Latino and the Spanish speaking communities. And it was a really nice way to virtually connect with publishers and learn about the new things that were coming out in the publishing world. Uh, now I'm gonna shift a little bit to what the Denver Public Library has done post COVID. 
And I, again, I just wanna reiterate that we're still in this transition moment. Um, we closed our branches in March of 2020. Uh, we started doing some sort of curbside work in the summer of 2020, and then finally opened up our branches in March of 2021. Probably some of you that are in this webinar um, maybe had a quicker timeline and you were forced to open sooner rather than later. We were a little bit uh, lucky in that sense. However, due to the layoffs and the budget cuts, we are still operating under uh, reduced hours. And that has definitely been a challenge and a barrier to, to begin welcoming communities back into the library. We know that the libraries are important spaces for our community. They serve as gathering spaces and they serve as shelter for others. And they serve as a point to connect with information for other folks. Um, so I wanna be mindful as I uh, share this, the information, by all means, we're taking it slow here. Um, and I hope that all of you have the opportunity to do that as well, because it's been a, some, a, a lot of hard couple of years and we don't wanna rush into anything. Uh, but one of the things that we definitely started during the pandemic that we're going to continue is um, we started loaning out tech, technology to our customers. Um, and we have about a combination of 300 Chromebooks and hotspots that are checked out for about three months. And we, we realize how important access to technology is particularly for our most vulnerable communities. Uh, so this was a great way to be able to continue to provide that service while our branches remain closed. And even now as we're open, as I mentioned, we have limited, limited hours. So this continues to be a really good way where we can provide connection with technology that serves the need for our customers. Um, and they can use this again for three months anytime they want, it's been, uh, it's been a pretty big success. So if you have the opportunity to do something like this, you don't have to start with 300 Chromebooks and hotspots, um, but it definitely helps. And I can tell you that all of our items are currently on a holds, holds list right now. Um, I also want to import, highlight the importance of partnerships. Um, during the pandemic, uh, our mobile services department partnered with a bunch of schools because they saw an opportunity as schools continued to provide free uh, lunches for the students. We would show up with our bookmobiles to give away free books. Um, giving away free books has been pretty amazing and a game changer for our outreach. Uh, so even after pre-COVID, post-COVID, we still, during our outreach events, give away free books. It's, it's just so wonderful to be able to see folks' faces when they get those free books and they still love them. Um, and then you, there's a picture there of a program that we did with a group of Nepalese folks that um, brings them into the library and it's kind of like a health slash walking program. Um, but this is just another example where we, we have to we can't do all of this work alone. I know that all of us are overworked and we're stressed out um, and we need to be able to connect with um, community partnerships so that we can collaborate on strengthening those programs and beginning to wel welcome folks back into the library. Uh, and that's all that I have. I know I could probably keep talking about this for another 40, 50 minutes, um, but um, we'll have time for questions at the end. And there's my contact information in case you want to reach out to me or have any questions. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Nikanor. Uh, very exciting to see how Reforma continues serving our library workers during the pandemic and the hard work on Denver Public Library. Now I would like to welcome Roxana Cruz. Roxana. Hi everyone, um, give me a second while I connect my, share my screen and are you able to see my screen? Yes, um, let me see, share. Okay, share. Boom, there we go. Hi everyone, thank you for being here today. Um, my name is Roxana Cruz and I am a librarian here at Santa Monica College and also a member of SLA's academic and education um, community and today's I'm today I'm going to share what um, the community college um, here are doing in California which aligns closely to what the SLA um, 
task force for reopening special libraries um, guidelines. Okay, so Santa Monica College right now is in phase three for recovery. This means that um, campus buildings are have limited access. Um, for example, the library right now is only open to currently register and vaccinated students or students with exam. Um, most faculty are teaching online and some are on ground, but they have to um, so they, they have to do like a daily um, symptoms checklist. There's um, a lot that's put into place for safety. Some of our academic programs and activities are coming back on ground, but slowly. So just a little um, background history. Um, so during COVID here in California and similar to the rest of the country and other countries, um, we completely closed the campus and we went completely contactless, contactless, which means we were providing virtual reference. And luckily at that, at that point, we had joined the consortium here in California Community Colleges. And so we were able to offer 24 seven chat assistance, but during our business hours, it was a SMC librarian providing service. Um, we made our uh, library services available off campus which meant we also had to expand some of our digital collection. Um, that included emergency um, digitization of our textbooks um, because as a um, community college, most of our students um, come from different um, socioeconomic background and our textbooks seem to be one of those hot items that everybody here on campus was using. So once we shut down, um, it became apparent that a lot of students needed access in order to complete their classes. So we started to digitize our textbooks because publishers weren't um, helping out with access. So we were just trying to serve our most, most vulnerable um, communities. And we also switched to um, virtual instruction using Zoom for orientation and also to deliver our library one classes. Um, this also provided an opportunity to launch our YouTube channel, which is, which was has been a project that um, here the librarians here at SMC been wanting to um, do, and the pandemic was the perfect time to launch it, and and so far it's been very um, useful, especially for our faculty who want to embed um, video tutorials about how to use the database or video tutorials about our um, workshops or recorded orientations and so forth. Okay, so right now we're in a period of transition. Um, at the beginning of fall 2021, we were the only campus, uh, the only building on campus open. Um, now in spring, we have student services building open as well. So that was quite a transition. So one of the issues that we ran into was um, there is a lot of hoops to jump through in order to open the library. And so we had to develop a safety plan and get institutional approval. We had to do a lot of walkthroughs with our emergency operations team. Um, and we had to do a lot of research and, and surveying of our, of our building to make sure that we can implement um, you know, social distancing, um, safe ways to deliver services, where, where the best points to put um, plexiglass um, and so forth. And also um, discuss how we were going to, um, you know, keep ourselves safe as well as our um, campus community. So luckily we had um, departmental buy-in. Everybody here in the library was open to coming back um, to campus. And so that made the process so much better because uh, everybody was collaborating in the process. And we really wanted to open to support our most vulnerable students who needed the quiet study space, that needed the Wi-Fi and the computers. Um, and so that luckily we got approval and we were able to open in fall. And so for our operational plan, we really based it on um, local and national health guidelines, as well as um, professional library organi organizations. Um, a lot of our, our plan fell in line with what the SLA task force uh, had developed as well, as well as ACRL. And of course, always going closely to what the CDC and LA County was um, 
providing us a skyline. So our current service model right now um, is, is flexible. I like to call it is flexible. <laughs> um, we are providing virtual and in-person reference um, or service points. We've made sure to um, single staff it so to create that social distancing. So we'll have one person at the reference desk while there's a person in the office doing chat. Um, now we also, we continue to have off-campus library access, but we have also opened the libraries I mentioned before, but it's restricted. So this has created some issues with our local community who used to use the library. Um, and now since it's only open to currently registered students um, and faculty and staff, it's, it's, um, it's created some issues. However, we've been trying to appease our members and we've even launched a little free library outside the library using one of our newspaper kiosks. Um, and we put out free books out there um, for our community and our campus to take as they please and keep and read. Um, another thing we've been doing, and we're gonna continue to keep as a model, is doing both Zoom and in-person instruction and orientation. Um, a lot of our classes are still not back on ground. I believe we're up to 30 to 40% on ground and everybody's still virtual. So doing our in-person instruction has come in handy for those students who are already on campus and instructors as well. Um, and so the Zoom is perfect for those instructors who are still uh, working remotely. So we're gonna continue that model because we see this even as we continue down to phase four, or phase five of recovery. Um, we know that we're probably not going to get all our classes back on ground like we had before. We're probably gonna continue in, in this similar manner because students have been um, really open about how happy they are doing remote work um, because of the flexibility. However, some of our classes that require labs uh, are gonna be coming back as well. Okay, so we stopped doing textbook um, digitization for many reasons, one of them copyright violation, of course, but this also helped us um, evaluate our program. Uh, so we used to have a paper form for textbook reserves and we, the faculty would have to come to the library, drop off the book, drop off the form. However, um, we've, we digitized our workflows for this. So now our faculty can access the form online. They no longer have to come to campus. They just submit it online and they can even arrange for the book to be mailed um, and ship, shipped from the publisher directly to the library. And then all we have to do is put it into our collection and then contact them and let them know that it's available. So this is something that's gonna continue moving forward and something that made us realize that some of our forms could, were a little outdated by the fact that we're still using paper, but it gave us an opportunity to really evaluate our services and how to make it more accessible to, to our community. Uh, another thing we also opened up was our study rooms. Um, originally, they were only available to group studies. And because there isn't um, a lot of airflow in there, in there we had to um, modify our, our like reservation um, calendar. So now students are able to book a room and they can be an individual or in a group. Um, we did this because we wanted to change, we wanted to make it make the space available for students who needed, who were on ground and were also taking online classes to have a quiet space to take their online class. So we, to be, in, uh, to be mindful of safety, um, we built in a 30 minute window to air out the room before the next person or group comes in. Um, also, we expanded our reservation time from two hours a day to four hours a day to accommodate those long classes. And this has been very popular and our students have been very happy about it. Um, and another thing we also did is we are now also providing Chromebooks. Our bookstore was the main point for um, giving out Chromebooks and loaning them out. But now the library has also taken that. Um, and so, 
something we did with the Chromebooks was originally we were just doing two week loans, but we realized our students needed more than two weeks, they needed it for the whole semester. So now we made our loan um, period more flexible. So now we are doing a whole semester long um, checkout. And also our YouTube channel continues to be updated and we keep uh, uploading materials. We keep getting great feedback from our faculty as well from our students, especially when they can attend a workshop, they know that there's gonna be a recorded workshop in our YouTube channel. So if they miss it, they can watch the recording. Um, and also we made our tutorials um, open, um, create a common licensee so, uh, so our faculty can easily embed that into their Canvas show. And something else we did was we launched our social media channels. So now we can get the word out about what's going on in the library and updating our campus community about our hours and about what upcoming workshops or what services are available in person or online. So what do we learn? So we overall, especially the first semester, we learned to be patient and we learned to listen. Um, as the only uh, building open on campus during the fall and the only place that students can see real life um, staff members uh, in the library, they were, um, they were, they would come in and be happy that we were open, but also wanted someone to listen about their grievances about what's going on on campus, about how difficult it is to get something done for student departments or student services and how it's un they're unable to access it. Um, and so it was important to listen to them. Um, and then if possible, you know, give solutions for that. But there was a lot, it was, it was something that definitely became apparent that, you know, we've been isolated for so long and we're experiencing all this stress. So it was really important to listen and to be compassionate about um, our community and their challenges that we're all facing. And it was also, it was very apparent that we needed to be um, mindful of our own mental health and as well as being kind to ourselves about projects and things that needed to get done and just being patient and, and setting realistic expectations about that. It also made us realize that nothing has to be perfect and we can just put out our best foot forward and then adapt and improve as we go along. So um, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, my contacts is up there. And as well as if you're interested in um, joining the Special Libraries Association, please visit our website at sla.org. Um, you don't have to work necessarily in a special library. You can be an academic librarian. And we have a special community for, that focuses on academic concerns, like the academic and education community. And um, you also see down there our, our social media handles if you want to connect and share ideas. But thank you so much to, for listening and for being here today. Thank you, Roxana. It's very interesting to see um, how librarians stepped up incredibly during the pandemic and um, launched new services. Um, I am, um, uh, we are tweeting and uh, we are highlighting some of these services and the solutions you identified. I, um, I want to highlight how you mentioned that um, you learned to be patient with yourselves and pay attention to mental health because um, it's a time that it has not ended, but it has affected students and also library workers. So very important uh, mention, thank you. And now we would like to uh, welcome Elisa Garcia from Nor Reforma Northeast. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Elisa Garcia. I'm the president of the Northeast chapter and a supervising librarian of teen services at the New York Public Library. Um, so just give me one minute while I share my screen over here.
Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Let me just, I'm gonna share my screen now one more time. We can see your screen, but you're muted. I, we're not getting any audio from you, Elisa. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry everyone about that. I was wrong with my mic. So again, sorry, my name is Elisa Garcia and I'm the president of the Reforma Northeast chapter and supervising librarian of teen services at the New York Public Library. So in my presentation today, I'm going to talk about rebuilding uh, library services after COVID-19, um, specifically for teens um, and how we went about doing that. So um, the first thing that we try to do and why it was very important to um, start the rebuilding of library services. Um, it was to you know, get our teens back into the libraries and the importance of the, the teen center. I work in one of the largest libraries in the Bronx and a very busy teen center. So there were different steps that we needed to take in order to um, bring our teens back, which was um, community building. So, and this was important because by bringing back that community and those patrons that we serve, we are preserving the history of the community and its people. Um, the commitment that we have with our communities, which is, you know, it solidifies, solidifies the, the mission of the libraries and of, you know, building equitable, diverse and inclusive services for all. Um, partnerships, so reaching out to our community members, rebuilding those, um, those relationships and with, with local stakeholders and for us specifically, um, the schools and other um, organizations that work with teens. Um, holistic leadership. Um, so just leading with empathy, um, flexibility and, um, and building sustainable relationships with um, the team members and, um, those, and those other coworkers as we adjusted with um, a new, you know, a new way of living and working. Um, so I talked a little bit about reintroducing the YA services at the at the Bronx Library Center um, specifically. Um, so we created a chart um, of a teen's guide to using the library um, because this was during the phase where it was like grab and go phase. They, they could come and get books, browse, but they couldn't stay for programs. So we decided to find a way to explain to the teens, this is the new way of, of programming. Um, so, you know, it went from you know, if you were just here for the books, what were you gonna do? If you needed to use a computer, um, returning items, uh, the library programming. So which was, we created a character um, named Miss Library Programming, which, you know, went over all the, you know, was like the steps to get into virtual programming and all of that. Um, and then we did write a little note on how things do look a little different um, because that's how services were definitely a whole lot different from what they were used to like two years ago. And then, um, and then you know, and then just being open to ask us questions. We also created tabletop displays in which, you know, teens could just grab information and flyers and other information. So these were our tabletop displays. Um, so one thing that I learned during this time was that, you know, we have our ideas of what we think are the library services, but then there's also what the community needs as well. So I think communicating with our teens and talking to other stakeholders in the community was the way um, of growing our services and the community needs. And I think um, senior leadership worked on that and listening what the staff was saying that 
our patrons were asking for and what they and what they needed. And I think as a whole, um, you know, just everyone working together was a way to bring back the community. So I think one of the things that definitely um, hit home and definitely I learned more from was that, you know, there's also that the big component of community needs because we are there to serve um, the public in our communities. And a lot of them didn't realize the services that we, um, you know, we're offering. And even now that we're fully, fully open, there are patrons that are still like surprised that, oh, they, they had no idea that we were open. Um, so another thing that played um, a role um, is the, another thing, another component of, of programming that was what's really huge during this time and just rebuilding was our college and career pathways program at the Bronx Library Center, um, which is a, is a post-secondary um, experience program in helping uh, young adults in navigating the college process or any other career options that they um, want. So we just don't focus on the on, on college, there's, you know, some people are interested in vocational schools or just alternatives to college. So we definitely um, embraced all of that. So we had to pivot this program during that time and sort of redesign it to fit the needs and the, and the, the needs and what we thought was that our teens needed and that, you know, and connecting them back to what they would be interested in being that, you know, they weren't going to the schools or, and then, you know, their connections with the guidance counselors. And so, so we definitely wanted to pivot and re-engage this program. So one of the things that we did um, was create a mindfulness program for this, which is still going on. And then the reason why we decided to do this was that COVID itself was definitely, um, you know, a very big, um, you know, mental health, um, grief, and all of that. So we definitely try to add mindfulness programs. So, you know, to help teens while navigating um, during this process to navigate their mental health and the importance of just um, self-care and just knowing what is, you know, what is going on mentally. And if you, you know, just check yourself on that. Um, working with a lot of st external stakeholders and creating virtual programming um, for colleges. Uh, vocational training and other um, educational opportunities, library use. So the library use become became a very important resource in this because we are the resource to this program and, you know, sharing our other resources that we have. So not just focusing on the career, college and career aspect of things, but also providing um, library services and the resources. So taking the opportunity, opportunity to share those well while doing the program. Um, Readers Advisory. So this also, this program provides us the opportunity to create lifelong library users and readers. So being able to introduce some book recommendations and um, also, uh, you know, what services are in the library and introducing them to the other things creates lifelong users um, for the library. Um, creators, um, fostering a growth mindset. Um, this program gave us the opportunity to create those, um, you know, you know, you have other opportunities that even if you're doing this virtually um, and all this stuff, and then just creating a, a relationship with, between these students um, and these teens. So, you know, you can, you can grow, um, you can be who you want to be, and here's the library to help you. Um, sustainability. So um, this program lends itself to create a, a centralized educational model for libraries that can be done all virtually. Um, through, um, you know, building those relationships, helping teens navigate the process of post-secondary experience, um, the college essay writing, and all of those things. So I think it's definitely something, a sustainable program that other systems um, and other libraries could look into. Um, so now I'm gonna jump over to um, community collections beyond the books. So, and I wanna talk a little bit about um, uh, the Judith Rivas mini grant, which was awarded to Lisa Melendez, one of the Reformer Northeast members. So during the um, pandemic in these past two years, um, Lisa pivoted a project that was supposed to happen in person into a full um, virtual um, photography exhibit um, with students in, 
in Bogota, Colombia. So, um, you know, through the grant lease, I was able uh, to do this and they've, they've exhibited and done um, their programming and we're very excited to eventually host them um, here in the US, but it was a way to use the resources of, of Reforma and um, so we're very thankful uh, for that and then for Lisa to um, pivoting and, and engaging these young people in, in art and, and photography and it's, it's truly um, an amazing project. So this was something that we considered that it was the community collections beyond the books and just not um, promoting that to um, for library services and, and other stuff that it goes um, beyond that. Um, for us and my own backyard, um, we were able to um, collaborate with the Universal Hip Hop Museum um, Education Center, which will be um, opening up in the Bronx um, in a few years. So um, students, well, teens had the opportunity to learn about their history. Um, that, and, you know, as many of you know, the Bronx is known as, as where hip hop was born. So this was, this gave us the opportunity for all virtual, of course, for teens to learn about like their own history, um, what it what it took, where did hip hop originate from, um, and all their stories. So this was a great collaboration between the Hip Hop Museum and the New York Public Library, um, in which you know um, our our teens had the opportunity to learn about themselves and who they are, which I think was something that in in conversation with our teens as they were. Um, coming into the library, they realized that they didn't know a lot about their neighborhood and they had to find creative ways while being stuck at home and finding the safe ways to go outside to um, and see that they were looking at their community in another, in a different light um, than because when they were able to just um, go on their own as, you know, as usual. So this was a definitely an eye-opening um, experience for us. And again, um, the only was not being able to go to those sites in person, being that um, we had to still do things virtually. Um, mental health became a very big topic, not only for um, the employees, but also for um, for the patrons we serve. So we definitely, what we decided to do was create a mindfulness on the go board where teens had the opportunity to grab things and just, you know, just take it with them. Um, to go and whatever they felt that they needed. So, and this is something that we're still applying and, and hope to continue. So as we, you know, a lot of our teens, unfortunately had a lot of loss in their lives. Um, some of them lost parents, um, you know, uncles, grandparents. So we had to find a way to gather together and, you know, just find how can we help these teens that will be coming here after experiencing um, such loss. Um, I forgot to add my contact information, but that is my presentation, but I will add it in the chat um, if anyone has any questions or, um, or any comments about my presentation or about um, any questions about what we've done at the New York Public Library and the Bronx Library Center, uh, please feel free to reach out and thank you and um, sorry about my mic issue earlier. Thank you so much, Elisa. You share uh, so much information about programming and services to uh, teens, which are, um, I, I usually hear that they are a bit of complex population to serve. So these are excellent examples for people to try to adapt them. I was, um, I was uh, very touched when you mentioned the fact that many people have lost and teams also have lost, and you have uh, your team have implemented wellness uh, methods, uh, including uh, something about grieving uh, sections on that. So that's very important, and it's uh, it's not a very easy task, right? Because we're all in this in this situation, but uh, it's commendable. And so thank you for sharing that and um, the collaboration with the hip hop museum. I'm looking forward to that too. <laughs> all right. Um, and next, we are having our last uh, and very important speaker today, and she's coming from the Caribbean, and I'm very happy about that. I'm from the Caribbean as well, and uh, she is Elizabeth Pierre-Louis. She's coming from Acuriel. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hello, everybody. I will share my screen immediately. <laughs> it's coming up. So um, I'm Elizabeth Pierre-Louis, and I'm executive. Secretary of Acuville. 
which is the regional association um, of, uh, as of um, libraries. Okay, sorry. And um, I am, it's been only a year that I have been in this position, but I have been before president, past president of Arcuville. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to present. Uh, it was um, very interesting for me um, to, the idea of presenting best practices about um, post-COVID-19 recovery. And while I was working on it, I was thinking of would I have been doing a survey? Would I have to present about my own country? And uh, this opportunity came that it was actually one of the teams of the ACU 2022 program conference. So it was a great opportunity to talk about Akiril, the upcoming conference, and also answer your questions. So thank you very much for this opportunity. So very quickly, I'll talk about Akiril. It was created in 1969, and it was a, an idea of academic libraries at the beginning. But finally, but um, uh, very quickly in this process, um, the association recognized that it should embrace all kinds of libraries, archives, museum, and information services in the larger Caribbean. So I posted the, um, the links to the different websites. And why are, am I talking about the annual event right now? It's because 16, 1969, it appeared that the best way to promote professional development within the Caribbean with all of these territories, as you can see, and all of um, the different languages, because there are three languages in the association, was to have an annual meeting. And it's called a conference, and it lasted seven days. Now it's about four days and a half. And this is an exhibit that we created in 2020 for the 50th anniversary of uh, the, the association and all the dots or the different places where um, there were conferences before. So let me get quickly into the subject. <laughs> so the conference team this year is, sorry for the ambient noise. <laughs> the conference team this year is um, change manage management and resilience proactive action in libraries, museum and archives of the Caribbean and it will take place from June 5 to 9 at the Crystal Marriott Beach Resort. And one specific team I thought summarized very well um, what was um, the presentation today. So about COVID and the new trends toward virtual events and everything, and everything that had to do also with resilience and the different challenges that um, these different units in the Caribbean are, have faced and are currently facing which don't only have to do with COVID, but also, as you know, we are under hurricane path, there are earthquakes and financial crisis also. So, um, and what the objective of this conference was to explore, describe, recommend alternatives, identify new trends, provide opportunities for discussion, and also a space to reflect and share best practices. And here is also presented Dr. Jeanette Lebron Ramos, who is the ACRO president 21-22, and who came with this uh, team. So we are very excited also because it was it will be the, the first conference on site that we were able to, to have since 2019. And also um, it will take place uh, in Curacao. There's a lot of, uh, um, already a lot of, uh, excitement around that and we're very pleased um, that our numbers of membership are, are, are rising as well as people attending. And so as you can see, I wanted to say just presenting the preliminary, preliminary program, as you can see already the keynotes have everything to do with resilience, with um, managing changes towards the future, future libraries in times of pandemic and also how prepared our libraries to maintain their services amid the COVID-19 pandemic, the case of the Puerto Rican collection. So we have presentation from Curacao, from the US, from Puerto Rico, but this is only for the keynotes. Um, we had, we were very, we had a lot of like, um, presentation for papers as well. About 50 were related to COVID-19 
COVID-19 and how libraries, museums, and archives in the Caribbean responded. Um, we had presentations that ranged from Guyana, Puerto Rico, Aruba, Cuba, the US, Curacao. And amid the big best practices presented, um, better collection management, library services, knowledge management, infographic use. And we, we decided to even highlight in a special panel presentation, the COVID-19 solidarity panel, um, where we showcased three special cases, one at the University of Guyana, one at the Sydney Martin uh, Library in the University of West Indies in Barbados at the Cave Hill campus, and also um, balancing traditional and virtual storytelling events in a post-COVID world, Aruba's Children's Book Festival, in 2022 and beyond, so mixing academic and also um, national and special collections from the National Library of Aruba. There were also nine workshops, and we have to say that um, these 30 um, presentations have to do with the whole program, but there are also specific programs that have to do with special interest groups as well as content area roundtables that also can present their own presentation and workshops. Um, for the poster session, we have um, tw 12 posters and we extended the deadline. Um, so we have posters that come from Guyana, from the US, Trinidad and Tobago, Puerto Rico, and all have COVID-19 pandemic components and how libraries responded. And the best practice presented are the use of social media, digital Caribbean collection, use of infographics. And we find that in the poster session, it's all a lot about how uh, virtual services were used. Um, I took a few titles to highlight a bit, um, prepared to function of, in spite of the COVID-19 pandemics as a push factor towards resi reliance and the sustenance, sustenance of libraries, information literacy using infographics, a virtual alternative for instruction, resiliencia, I'm sorry, my Spanish will be horrible, I already apologize, resiliencia e innovación en servicios virtuales que promueven la integración de nuevas voces al ecosistema investigativo. So um, our commentary is that uh, to this wide range of examples of eagerness to share, to present best practices, we can show that Caribbean libraries, archives, and museums are resilient in learning through adverse situations to use technology, train, share knowledge, network, anticipate, and mitigate. And I wanted to especially acknowledge the work of the actual president, her program committee, the executive council, and actual 22 Curacao local organizing committee, and a quick note just about the logo that's there because it's uh, it's inspired by the text Ubuntu Caribeño de Bibliotecas. The features of the logo are open flying books that symbolize libraries with a common purpose, which as it were, take flight to one central point, a flock of birds of all kinds. So I will try, I will finish here. I really tried to respect my time of work. If you have extra questions, please feel free to ask me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, the Caribbean has been also immersed in helping librarians serve um, their communities. I personally attended a number of webinars presented by Acuil during the pandemic uh, on different topics to help librarians. And so thank you. And, and you know, Acuil is my first, was my first library association, so. And you are, our star, you are our star librarian. <laughs> Thank you. I've been to uh, quite of the uh, conferences too. Um, and so now we have um, some minutes for questions for our speakers. We have heard uh, a really a variety of different services during the pandemic from library associations and to academic and public libraries. Um, I don't see questions. Um, I saw some questions related to copyright and digitization. I think they were answered. So that was wonderful that we did that in the chat. And um, I don't see any other, but this is a time where we have uh, speakers here uh, from different uh, regions in the Americas to ask. And I'm happy to see there are people from different countries, including Peru. I heard there are colleagues from Germany 
and, um, and colleagues from different parts of the States and Mexico. And um, we are going to share the recording link um, through Reforma um, media channels and through the different listservs. But um, before we go, I would like to give time to our speakers to say a brief final remarks, something they wanted to say, something they want to share with our attendees and with those that will listen to their recording and uh, or if from associations or uh, libraries as well. So I will start with um, Nicanor and move along in the same order you guys spoke. Thanks, Lloyda. Um, I just, for everyone here who's working in libraries or information institutions, um, your work is unbelievably valuable. We really appreciate it. Uh, I know being a, a manager that the work that libraries do wouldn't happen with our frontline staff and we're very grateful um, for all the work that they do and connecting with our community and providing these valuable programs and services. Also, what I forgot to mention in, during my presentation, if you want to become a Reforma member, we're always looking for members. Uh, you can join by going to reforma.org slash join. Thank you all. Uh, Roxana. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for being here. I did see that our current academic and education um, community president, Navi Hassan, was on here online from India. So that was great. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Um, and if you want to connect, um, please reach out. Um, you can find me at smc.edu forward slash library, or you can also find me at sla.org. And if you'd like to become a member or know more about our organization, please reach out. We have our conference coming up in July, so check that out. Thank you. And thank you, everybody in this panel. It was a pleasure being here and presenting with you all. I think there is a question for you, so I'm going to take it now. Um, Ana Maria, let me know, is this question about elaborating about uh, community engagement services? Is this for Roxana? You can type it in the chat. Yes, for Roxana. Okay, let me see. Um, oh yes, so for our community engagement is twofold. One, um, First is getting the word out to our faculty and staff about us being open because for the most part, a lot of them didn't know that we opened in the fall. And so we wanted to make sure that information got out. So our, our students will also, that information would trickle down to our students. So we did a lot of, we did email blasts. Um, we also launched our um, social media channels and we added all the department channels from across campus. Um, that helped us also grow our followers as well as grow our student following. Um, so we've been doing every Wednesday, I do a post, did you know, um, where I share a tidbit or a fact about the library and its services. And it has um, gotten really great responses, especially when I let students know that we've installed the new software or um, in our computers that they can now use for their computer science class or so forth. Um, we also started doing giveaways. Um, we had our department chair donated some, some anime stuff that we, so we do little challenges to engage our community and then we do giveaways. Um, for our community members, we've created the little free library um, by contacting our newspaper um, on campus and asking for permission to use their newspaper kiosk. So we're able to use it for the rest of the semester, but come fall, We'll have to return it and hopefully find a new way to do that. Um, so it's gotten, um, we've gotten some books taken um, to loving homes. So um, I think that's really helped with our community, especially since they're unable to come in and the public libraries here in California are just open for browsing. There's no like sit down and read a book, um, although that's um, going to be changing soon now that indoor masking is not required anymore, although it, right now that even though the county has removed the restriction of having to wear um, a mask indoor, um, most um, businesses and 
you know, like our, our community college, for example, is also still reinforcing the mass use indoors. So, but that might be helping open up some new um, services um, to the rest of the community so they can also enjoy the library. Thank you, thank you. All right, and we continue with Elisa. So I want to say first, thank you, um, Loida, for inviting me to speak, and um, my other colleagues. I learned a lot from from all of you. Uh, so what I wanted to say is that, um, well, I think there was a question in the chat. Actually, let me answer that. Um, I think from from two of our attendees who were talking about, were asking me about what were inside the the pocket, um, the mindfulness pockets. So what we included in those were. Um, like little uh, quotes, activities, or people that you can talk to um, when needed. So we definitely uh, gave the resource because we are limited with what we can do at the library, especially because during that time when we had those mindfulness pockets, we weren't really having that much interaction with um, with the teens because the services were very limited and stuff. So, so definitely um, connect them with resources where they can um, search for help, but also provide them with activities as to um, if you're feeling stressed, go out for a walk, um, and the importance of taking care of their mental health and when to speak uh, to, to someone. Um, and also just uh, keep in mind, just teen services, like uh, Lorna mentioned, they're a very complex group. And sometimes uh, they are the, uh, the forgotten patrons of the, of the library. So we definitely um, wanna provide more services for them. So thank you. Thank you, Elisa. And um, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. I, I, I really enjoyed following all the different presentation. I, and I love what you just said about mindfulness. I think it's, it's a really important point. Um, what I can take from um, looking at everything that was submitted to us is really how um, the profession really use all their skills and to reorient, reorient it to um, different dimensions, using virtual, using social networking, using community, using protocols. Um, I really uh, enjoyed one presentation. They were just saying, you know, we have to put in line protocols so that people know when they what what they have to do, and and how these skill sets are used and uh, adapted. For me, these are always great examples. Well, thank you all, and again, thank you to our reforma team supporting this um, webinar, and to all of you that are still with us. Uh, check out the recording when it comes out, and remember, we are going to have another webinar. Uh, with other two library associations later in the spring. So now be well and uh, wellness for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye.